Erev Tov, everybody. Great to be together. Hard to believe that we are less than a week from Rosh Hashanah on the heels. Maybe I should say better on the wings of last night's Slichot concert and Slichot with Rebelli. And this is an opportunity for us to spend uh, about 45 minutes or so together sharing a little bit of personal Torah, some sparks to take us into the Yamim Noraim as a community. And uh, our format is as follows. This is also an opportunity to introduce uh, our two wonderful rabbinic interns, Dr. Susan Hornstein and Aaron Wildowski to the Bay community. You'll be seeing them over Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, many Shabbatot and programs over the coming year. And so we wanted to kick off our get to know you, uh, having them here with us as part of the rabbinic team for this pre-high holiday round robin. Uh, as we've done before other Chagim and in previous years, we'll each be sharing a little bit of Torah and personal reflection in uh, in the setting of two different prompts, one followed by the other in which you'll hear from each of us, uh, and then a quick little fun lightning round of more spontaneous reactions to individual word sparks for the Amim Noraim. So with the uh, Kavana uh, and gratitude that as a bite we always grow together, we learn from each other, and uh, our hearts are open the most when we're together. We're grateful that you're here uh, to each of you and looking forward to sharing a little bit of Torah uh, and a little of personal reflections as we journey together towards Rosh Hashanah 5784. Our opening uh, round will be a question for uh, each of us to share. Um, myself uh, will go at the end. We'll hear from Rabbi Bracha. We'll hear from Aaron, we'll hear from Rabbi Sarah, we'll hear from Susan, and then from me on this question, what's your favorite or a favorite high holiday tefillah or teaching? Uh, when Aaron and Susan take their turns, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves by sharing just a, a word or a few words about themselves as they get started. And in the meantime, uh, before Rabbi Bracha goes first, please take a moment to use the chat uh, and share from our Bayit Kahal, all those who are gathered, for you, what's a favorite high holiday tefillah, line, phrase, teaching uh, that really speaks to you as we approach Rosh Hashanah? We'll take about 15 or 20 seconds to pop those things into the chat. Please do share them with us. Often they align with the ones we'll be sharing. And uh, then in just a few moments, Rabbi Bracha will begin answering that prompt uh, of what is a favorite high holiday tefillah or text to share. So feel free to use the chat over the next few moments to sh share your answer. And then Rabbi Bracha will begin. Hey, everybody. Love doing this with everyone. Thank you, Rip Steven, for the prompt. So hard to pick. That took me longer, I think, than preparing something. So many that are favorites and that are meaningful. I'm going to share the, the text of what I want to talk about today. This is the tefillah that the chazan, before Musaf, says something, some of it out loud, and some of it the chazan says to himself. Why is it that I love this tefillah? I find that right before Musaf, I know this year we have Shofar one day and one day we don't have the opposite. Shabbat we won't have Shofar and Sunday we do. But generally it's after Shofar and there is a stillness in the air that to me feels unique. Everybody has this uh, expectancy, a hush falls as we wait to move into the pinnacle of the Rosh Hashanah and the Yom Kippur davening. And I feel that on one hand there's a hush, and on the other hand there's almost a hum, 
of electricity in the air as we focus our attention on one person lifting his voice. And it is almost always, it's a beautiful, sweet, powerful, whatever that chazan has, that we love hearing. It's usually a voice that we've heard in years before, so it feels familiar and beloved. And I love the words that were put. It's the only time that a chazan does this. And it echoes for me a bracha that I always say before I teach anything or lead something. And that has two parts. The first one, shatir bracha, that there should be a blessing of whatever it is that, that we're doing as leaders, as teachers, here as a and also it should be it should be in honor of the people who came to join. I say the same thing as well for this group. And I just want to point out a few words that really pop out and speak to me and really elevate the kedusha, the feeling of holiness in the air when the chazan says this. One of them is, if you look down where, my, where I put the cursor, we call God's name Gadol, Gibor, Venora, Kel, Elion. These are names we're familiar with, but how many times do we hear Eheye, Asher, Eheye? I will be what I will be. This is what God told Moshe when Moshe asked God for God's name. But this is such a unique time where we actually hear God's name. <coughs> and, Shekol um, HaMalachim. All of the angels, I'm imagining that the angels are winging their way to God and bringing not just the Chazan's prayer, but all of our prayers up to Kisei HaKavod. And it's as if we have the angels on our side bringing that up lemala, lemarom to God. And at the very end, where the Chazan finishes, Baruch Atah, blessed are you, God. The word isn't there, it's implied. Shomea Tefila, who listens to prayer. I feel like there's so much wrapped up, and I invite everybody to listen so carefully, read the English, just listen to the Chazan's voice when you hear how the Chazan brings us into the Musaf prayer with this personal Tefila. Great. Uh, thank you, Rabbanit Bracha. That was beautiful and uh, a choice that really, that really resonates with me. Uh, my name is Aaron. Uh, as uh, Rav Stephen uh, said, I'm one of the one of the new interns here. I'm a rising, well, I guess, a current now third year student at, uh, at Yeshivat Chovei Torah, right upstairs in the in the Bayit, and very very excited to be here this year. I live on the Upper West Side, uh, but will be coming up to Riverdale periodically for Shabbatot. I'm originally from the Washington, D.C. area. Not sure what else to say about myself. Those are the basics. I look forward uh, to get, getting to know you all uh, throughout the course of the coming year. So uh, I don't have any text to share on the screen, but I wanted to talk about a Gemara that has really, really brought a lot of meaning to my experience of the Yamim Noraim the past few years. Uh, it's a Gemara in Rosh Hashanah that goes from uh, Daf Tetzayin to Yudzayin. And in this, uh, in this sugya, Chazal talk about three books that Hashem opens before Rosh Hashanah. A book of Tzadikim Gemurim, completely righteous people, Reshaim Gemurim, completely evil people, and Benonim, in between people, which I would really say are this pro probably all of us. Uh, and it says that the, you know, the, the righteous people are immediately written for life, the wicked people immediately for death, and those who are in between are suspended. They're tluin ve'omdin. They hang in the space between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And so this framing is not actually the Torah I want to share. This is just some important background. I actually find the framing kind of difficult. But it sets up some very, very beautiful Torah. We have, as in many other places in the Gemara, a machloket between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel about what this third category, Benoni, mean, what it means that they are tluin, suspended. Beit Shammai say that they are sent down to Gehinom and they're raised back up by God. There's this dramatic, torturous cleansing process across the board for everybody in the Benoni category. And they may eventually end up written for life, but they really are put through this traumatic experience. But for Beit Hillel, because Hashem is Rav Chesed, as we say during the, during the Midot, 
Hashem is uh, is abundant in in love and in kindness. Because Hashem has this trait, God is mate klape chesed. God has a leaning, a netia, a tendency toward the virtue of chesed and does not put the benonim through gehinom, does not put them through this process. So I love, first of all, the mental image of God setting up this process of deen, which is ostensibly very objective, very based on ethics, but then ultimately having a soft spot for Bnei Israel, having a soft spot for God's amsegula and tipping the scales just a little bit in our favor when it comes to Dean. I find that very, very heartwarming, that image. And also as a personal call to action, I think mate klape chesed, air on the side of chesed, is really concise, really manageable. It's not overwhelming. We're not being told ase chesed, be just, or be loving and kind all the time, because that's really hard. And none of us really succeed at that. But we're told air on the side of chesed be incrementally more loving than what your baseline would be. So that's what I have, you know, been trying to think about throughout this Elul, and I hope it brings some chizuk to all of you. Hi, everybody. Um, So good to see your faces and your names. And um, I have been thinking about names and changing names and what it means to change in general. But the uh, tefillah that I wanted to start with is this little paragraph that occurs right after Unotana Tokev, right before Kedusha. And the whole tone of the tefillah changes um, from a somber, um, maybe even or fearful tune to something where we're a little bit more, we're a lot more joyous in the bayit. It's a little jumpy <laughs> for some people. Um, and there's like a transformative moment. Um, there's no end to your years. No, there's no limit to the length of your days. This, of course, is talking about God. Immeasurable are the chariots of angels to glorify you, capital U, God, and there is no way to describe your imperceptible name. Literally, we don't know how to pronounce God's name or say God's name at the, the yud, yud hey vav hey. And then it says, Shimchana elacha, your name is fitting for you, but atana elishmecha, and you're worthy of your name. And then it says, Ushmenu, and our name. You have called by your nation, Krata Bishmecha. So there's clearly a, and it goes on, act for the sake of your name and sanctify your name through those who hollow your name for the sake of your glorious name, which is reverence and sanctified with the mystic speech and the holy strafim who sanctify your name in the sanctuary, et cetera, et cetera. There's a real emphasis on asking us to imagine God's name, the imaginable really. And because of God, because of God's name, we sanctify him, we call out in joy God's name. But it says in the middle that, and you're worthy of your name and our name. There's something about a focus on who we are at that moment, on our shma, on our name. You have called you have called by your name the um note over there is is explains that we are called Yisrael, which has God's name in it. And so there is a connection, an automatic connection between our name and God's name. But what I really started thinking about is this focus on names. You see, because in Hilchot um, um, Tshuva, in Rambam Tilchot Tshuva, in the second chapter, there's a uh, emphasis on how one goes about changing. And the way you change is that you literally have to change your name. One changes his or her name as if to say, I am a different person and not the same person who has sinned. You have to change your name. I felt a little bit bothered by this, especially given that right after this, this um, climax of, of the Yonatana Telkev, which is a, you know, talking about how we're going to repent and how we're going to change. And then we're talking about um, glorifying God's name. In the back of my mind, I have this 
sentence from Rambam about the way in which we do tshuva, which is we have to essentially change who we are, our entire essence. And then I start thinking maybe what is actually happening there is that it's not obvious, we obviously don't change our name, but we have, when we do tshuva, we have to still hold on to our essence. We have to hold on to our most basic name, our, base, our most basic who we are. We have to lift it up. We have to elevate it, just like we are calling out to elevate God's name. Um, and we have to think about the parts and the things and the actions that we might want to transform. But ultimately, we have to do so by embracing our, uh, who we as most essentially are, our most essential selves. And that's hard. That's hard to both embrace ourselves and let ourselves go. But I think that we can do that if we hold on to the idea that our name is our essence and it's connected to the fact that we're calling out God's name and God is recognizing who we are, our name, Shminu, um, in this dialogue that we're having between Onatana Tokev and the Kedusha. Did you want to add a word, Susan? We can come right back. I wanted to share uh, a thought um, from a section of the tefillah very close to Rabbi Sarah's and uh, others mentioned Unatana Tokef in their writing, uh, writing in on the chat. And um, this is the tefillah that's been echoing in my heart and mind uh, as we approach Rosh Hashanah this year. Um, it's from within the Unatana Tokef liturgy, and uh, it's my custom usually to sing it to the melody of Eilecha Hashem Ekra, and I'm just going to do a little of the beginning and a little of the end. Adam Yesodo Me'afa Person's beginning is from the earth. And our place of return is to return to the earth. And as the as the liturgy goes on to describe the ways in which the human being is analogized uh, to broken pottery shards, to a fading, fading flower, to a wind that blows, the last is what really stands out to me, kachalom ya'uf. It's translated here like a fleeting dream. And if we take the beginning and end, the idea that a human being originates from dust and returns to dust, and then this end section, kachalom ya'uf, that we are analogized to a, a fleeting dream, and this is all set up in contrast to God, who is melech el chai v'kayam, the almighty, the living and everlasting God. There's a sense of the fragility, the delicate, the frailty of the human condition. We come back to the way we began as nothingness, as literally just particles of soil that that go back to the way they came and we dissipate like a dream we had one night that's gone the next day. But I also think that built into this is the incredible power of the human being. Our origins are from earth. We come from the most durable, eternal material that we can relate to. The ground that we walk on is what we come from. And in going back to it, we again become part of something which is absolutely eternal. And as for a chalom ya'uf, a fleeting dream, I want to also think about ya'uf as flying. Not flying away, but flying high, soaring. 
the idea that a chalom ya'uf is something which is always out there, a dream that we have and it floats with us and it soars and we're always reaching out to try to um, actualize it. And uh, so my my wish for us as we approach Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Unatana Tokef, in which, um, in which we recite this tefillah, is to feel both the true frailty and fragility of our condition and the incredible power that we have as human beings in coming from earth, from that most foundational of elements, and of being able to dream dreams that literally, literally fly. I made a little Zoom glitch in uh, not setting up Dr. Susan Hornstein to be able to speak. So we're taking it right back to her to introduce herself and share some words. Thank you. I'm Susan Hornstein. I am a third year student at Yeshivat Maharat. Um, I live in Highland Park, New Jersey, although I grew up in Boca Raton, Florida before it was cool and before Rabbi Sarah. <laughs> and um, I uh, live in Highland Park with my husband, Dustin, and we have three kids who are all in uh, Jewish education. One of them actually teaches in middle school because somebody has to do it. Um, I wanted to talk today about a section of the Tila that um, okay. Okay. Are you seeing the Safari page? Yes. Okay, great. In every Amidah that we say over Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, kind of stuck right into the middle of a part that we're very familiar with, is what actually amounts to kind of a Kavanah for the rest of the Amidah. So we say the first parts, we stick in a little bit of Tzuchim in there, and then we say, as we always do. And right before we get to this really pivotal moment where we crown Hashem King and say, we stick in these paragraphs. And they start, Please give fear, Hashem Elokeinu, on all of your creations and awe on all that you have made. And your other kind of fear, other kind of awe, place that on your creations, that all of the ones you've made will bow down to you. So we'll start there. We have two different, three different expressions of the type of awe. There's pachdecha, pachad, ema, yira. And then we also have two different expressions of God's creations, ma'asim or ma'asecha, and biruim or ma'ashabarata. And these different kinds of creations are supposed to have different kinds of reverence, awe, or fear for God. Now, some of the Mepharshi maintain that these ma'asim are actually Jews, but it is much more traditional to look at the words Berlin and ma'asim as God's creations, all of the parts of the world, the humans, animals, inanimate objects, all of the things that make up the world. And it seems that all of those things need to have awe of God, and that's required for us to get to the part where we crown God king, where we say, HaMelech HaKadot. And once all of those creations in, in our tzvilah have this yirah and ahava, yirah and kavod and pachad and all of that of God, then it says something very curious. It says, they asu kulam aguda acha. They're all going to be made into one aguda. Now the question is, what's an aguda? And it means a bundle. And I looked through all the different places in Tanakh that it's used. And one time, and a very famous time actually, it seems to me a bundle of azo or hyssop, which we use to dip in blood and paint our doorposts in order to avoid the um, angel of death coming along during Makat 
on the night before we are uh, released from bondage in Egypt. All of the rest of the times, it actually means groupings of people, sometimes groupings of different kinds of people coming together, and sometimes groupings of similar people coming together. But it generally means groupings of people. And to me, this means that the ma'asim and the buruim, the animals, vegetables, and minerals, the beasts and the humans, the Jews and the non-Jews, all in some way have to have reverence for God and all have to actually join together and become aguda achat. And then at the very end of it, the result is that the tzadikim, which is those who are very invested in God becoming king, when they see all of the fear, awe, and honor being accorded to God, they're going to rejoice. It's nechu. There will going to be joyous song. Evil will melt away. And God will be crowned king of all the entire world. And all it takes is recognizing that we are all in this together. I our second prompt is the question, what is a mida or character trait you're thinking about or working on this high holiday season? So please feel free all to use the chat to type in an aspect of personality, um, a way of being in the world that you're thinking about or working on as we approach the new year of 5784. And uh, we will each share in turn in the same order. Uh, this time, Susan will be able to speak in her assigned spot because we have that fixed. Uh, Rabbi Nibracha, Aaron, Rabbi Sarah, Susan, and me. Go ahead, take a moment to type uh, reflections reactions into the chat to this prompt. What's a midah or character trait you're thinking about or working on this high holiday season? Thank you, Tzvi. That was a perfect lead-in, being a better listener. I think that what was reverberating in my head when I was thinking about what me I would like to work on was what I spoke about before in Hinani Animi Ma'as, when the Chazan says that prayer before Musaf, and there's a hush. That is the Midah that I would like to work on. I would like to quiet, to create a hush in my own thoughts when I'm listening to someone to be able to hear better, to be able to quiet what I'm thinking so that I can see what this person in front of me, next to me, talking with me, and that can be as a rabbi, that can be as a mother, that can be as a sibling, as a spouse, as a friend. What does that person need? I read an article by somebody who was suffering from long COVID and here's what she suggested. When you hear somebody who's coming to you, speaking to you, ask them, if they want to be heard, hugged, or helped. Just because you have a lot of suggestions for them, that doesn't mean that that's what they want or need. Just because you want to hug them, that may not be what they need at that moment. So that's what I'm gonna work on, is quieting my thoughts to be a better listener. Hi, everyone. 
Um, I want to work on patience and I'm thinking specifically about patience as it pertains to the process of forgiveness, whether I am the forgiver or the forgivee. I think one of the hardest parts about that process to me is the waiting, whether it's waiting for the right moment to apologize, waiting for the other party to be ready to forgive or for myself to be ready to be forgiven. Uh, the difficulty lies in that delay, that in-between time. Um, and uh, there's a there's a Gemara in Masechet Yoma, Daf uh, Amud Bet, which gives a confusing and at first kind of counterintuitive teaching here. Rish Lakish talks about a person who is Bali Taher, who comes to purify themselves, do so you know do a positive action, and says a Bali Taher Misayinlo, one who comes to purify is, is is supported, is helped, and okay, so far so good, that makes sense. Uh, but then the Gemara gives a mashal, which uh, is kind of confusing because it compares this person who's going to do something positive to one who comes to a spice seller to buy a farsimon, a fragrant spice. And the spice seller says to this person who's coming to to, to purify, uh, I'm 10, wait. So this is confusing to me because this person is ostensibly going to be helped. We just said about, we just said a bali teher misayinlo. But instead, they are getting a they're getting hit by this obstacle by the command to wait. And if we look at that for as a metaphor for teshuva, I think first we can say intuitively that teshuva can't happen on our terms alone. We have to wait until the other party is ready, and that's that's a very valuable lesson to take from this mashal. But the Gemara actually takes it a step further, because the spice seller doesn't just say ham ten; they say ham ten li ad she emdod imcha. Wait for me until I can measure this fragrant spice with you, so that you and I can be impacted positively by the fragrance together. And this is so beautiful to me because what it seems to suggest, comparing it to teshuva, is that the teshuva process is so beautiful and so holy that when we wait for others to participate in it with us, that's not just something that we owe to them as an act of patience, it actually elevates uh, our experience into something that happens together in a really special way that perfumes our broader world of relationships. Thank you. Um, Rav Siva knows that I, I wasn't loving this prompt. It's very um, vulnerable and personal and um, and I want to work on everything all the time, and it's impossible to work on anything ever. <laughs> um, I think that's something that I am very focused on right now, though, is just trying to bring more joy into my life. And I know that sounds maybe like it's not a Mida characteristic that needs to be worked on, but the truth is, is um, in my experience, joy is something that has to be curated. It has to be something that has to that one has to make space for. And I think Rosh Hashanah is specifically the time where I think about that. Um, when uh, Sarah laughs, it says she laughs with Kiba, she laughs within. She creates a space within herself in order for that laugh to resonate. Um, and uh, I've always just, you know, I I, I think I might have shared this before but just as I was thinking about this I I always love the um picture of Mark Chagall's lithograph um I don't know if I can share it let me just see if I can get it on the screen there it is um it's called Sarah and the Angels and you can see it's the uh, it depicts the scene that we're going to read about on the first day of Rosh Hashanah where the three angels come and she overhears that she's going to have a child and she laughs and you can see that that a um, character of the, the characteristic of the picture is a shofar there's a shofar um, coming out of the angel's mouth and uh, the the literally the kirba the space that she has created is in the shape of a shofar um and if if you remember that that's the moment she laughed, then the shofar there, therefore, is a symbol of laughter, a symbol of joy, something that has to be literally made space for, um, because perhaps it's not always so simple and easy for all of us to, to find that joy.
characteristic that I have been working on and really hope to continue to work on is to be present wherever I am. Is in somehow we're getting some static. I'm not sure if it's coming from your audio. I don't know. Should I continue? Yeah, it goes away when you're muted. I don't know if anything changed on your end in terms of the sound. No? All right. So um, go ahead and unmute again, and we'll turn that on off a bit. As I mentioned, I have children in all different places. Um, I have family. I have other obligations. I have school obligations, like so many of you. Um, and and much more mundane things too like my emails and the spelling bee and all of the other things that can grab my attention at different times and different places i really wish i could be like seeing my one-year-old grandson walk starting to try to walk and the challenge for me is that wherever i am at that moment that i want to just be in that place doing that thing and not let all of the other things that I could be doing or might wish that I was doing um, interfere with the thing that I actually am doing, the person I'm speaking to, the class I'm listening to at that moment. I've also been thinking about patience in uh, this high holiday season, patience as a parent, patience in my interactions with all the people in my life and patience with myself and a teaching about patience, which I came across in the Ale Shur, a wonderful contemporary book of Musar, but I haven't been able to put my hands back on again. So take my word for it, or maybe somehow it interwove with something in my brain and now is coming out in this way is the recognition that the word for patience in Hebrew, Savlanut, comes from a Shoresh of Lisbol, Lisbol sometimes means to suffer. Really, it means to bear, to carry. Savlanut is the capacity to carry whatever we are contending with when we encounter something that causes us to feel impatient. It's the capacity to carry the anxiety about whether it's going to go the way we want it to or the way we feel in a rush to achieve the outcome. Being able to sort of bear that in a steady way is what helps us have patience. And what the Aleshur um, suggests as a beautiful practice is to kind of imagine every time we encounter another person, a backpack on their back. The backpack on their back is the things that they're carrying. Disappointments, hopes, challenges, for me, when I think about parents, that the backpack um, has my children's age on it. So I remember that I'm talking to a seven-year-old, not a 27-year-old. And uh, it's the it's the package that comes with the person that I want to try to always be noticing. And in some small way in my encounter with them, put their backpack on my back as I interact with them. So it's that midav savlanut of patience that means bearing with the person I'm interacting with, whatever it is, of course, I don't even know all the things in their backpack, but bearing a little bit of what they're carrying with them, with me, to help me more gently and patiently make my way into my communication with them. A moment of uh, nigun as we get ready for our final round.
In the lightning round, each of the five members of our team will share a word. We have not told each other our words beforehand. We'll each share a word that somehow in our own minds links to the season of the High Holidays. And, uh, and then two of us, in the interest of time, two of us will be the respondents. We'll have a few moments to uh, take in the word, and then we'll share 15 seconds, 30 seconds of what that word brings up for us in our relationship to the High Holidays. Uh, I'll just list now the order of uh, the team of who will be presenting the word. And when I say each word, I'll then say who are going to be the two respondents. I'll be sharing the first word, then it'll be Susan, then Rabbi Sarah, then Aaron, and then Rabbi Bracha. As I share my word, we'll take a few moments to take it in and reflect, and then Rabbi Sarah and Aaron, in turn, will be our respondents. Have fun, take it however you want to take it. Um, the word for me, approaching Rosh Hashanah 5784, is time time we never have enough of it we never have enough time um my entire life i've wanted there to be more than 24 hours and seven days a week and especially the crunch before rosh hashanah um to have the food ready the torah ready the guest list ready the clothing ready, the logistics ready feels like an extra burden of getting it all done. Um, and yet, as I'm saying this, I just want to also say that what a gift time is. Time is a, a gift, a gift that we can do with what we what we most want. If we can just pull back a little bit and give ourselves permission to do what we need with the time, the gift of time that we have. The, the first place my mind went in terms of time is time in the sense of Isman Kavua, a fixed time. I'm really, really grateful that we have this season as a time set aside to focus on self-improvement, on chesed, on because I don't think it would happen to the extent it does, at least for me, if it was just something we were supposed to generally try to do throughout the year. I mean, not that we're not, we obviously are, but if we didn't have a special time to focus, I certainly feel like I would be at a much lower level in those things. So I'm grateful for the time we're given. Susan will present the next word and the respondents will be Rabbanit Bracha and Aaron. The word is honey. You know, I love challah and honey. I love apples and honey, but I particularly love challah and honey, and I could never get enough of it. And now since I'm gluten-free, this is what I discovered. My little oat roll, which is the only way I can do a hamotzi, tastes terrible with honey. Every year I try it, and it never gets better. So that's what I think of. I still love honey, but I can't have it with my challah. I can have it with the apples, though. I think of those uh, little honey sticks we used to get in school in kindergarten, first grade, um, how they get everywhere. I guess it's memory for me in a sense. I Honey isn't a major part of my diet throughout the year. You know, maybe it's an ingredient in certain things. So the first place my mind goes when I hear honey is uh, apples and honey, Rosh Hashanah, and just the little rituals that uh, make up the role these holidays play in our lives are, are very important to me. The next word comes from Rabbi Sarah, and I'll respond, followed by Susan. Um, pomegranates. Pomegranates. There, I'm going to uh, say something myth-busting. 
I've never gotten a pomegranate with 613 seeds in it. I still love them, but I've just never, I've never succeeded in getting one with 613 seeds. Uh, but for me, the pomegranate, it, my association, we're actually a big pomegranate eating family. It's one of the only things that I feel like we still have consciousness of seasons because at some point you can't get them in Costco anymore for months and months, and then you can again. So the appreciation of actual fruits that are only available seasonally. Um, and I have many socks with pomegranate stains. I was also going to talk about the seeds because I have this memory of my daughter and her friend actually pulling a pomegranate apart and counting the seeds and finding that there were many, many, many more than 613. Um, also, last year when we were in Israel, um, our neighbor was keeping an eye on our house and I decided I needed to bring her back a gift and our neighbor is not do it. And I was trying to think what an appropriate gift from Israel was going to be for a not do it person. And I found this beautiful little China pomegranate and I brought it back for her. And she said, oh, I know about this. There's something about the number of seeds. <laughs> we, I went on a tour of Israel and, and they told us this. So this is a very, very enduring thought about pomegranates. And I have pomegranate earrings that I read about. The next word comes from Aaron. Rabbanit Bracha, and then I will respond. My word is simcha, or happiness. That's awesome. Hmm. I am filled with joy on the Amim No Ra'im and actually on Yom Kippur even more than on Rosh Hashanah. If you ask me which Chag I prefer, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, even though I have a hard time fasting, I won't say that it's easy. I am so filled with joy and every time there's song, I'm dancing and somehow, smiling, from beginning to end. I love the Chagim. I, I think I inherited that from my parents. And um, thank you for reminding me about the Simcha and that Yom Kippur is a Chag and it Yom Shah Simcha. Thank you. Simcha le'artzecha v'sason le'irecha that's one of my go-to melodies on the Amim Noraim. I think it it anchors us in the strength and joy of the day, and it's act, it's a, also a melody which I have exported um, to uh, Birkat Erusin uh, and um, under the chupa that that swell from the slow to the crescendo of joy. I feel the melody speaks so much to uh, Chatan and Kala, to the moments under the chupa, and it brings a little flavor of the high holidays um, to the wedding canopy. The last word comes from Rabbi Nibracha, Rabbi Sarah, and then Susan will respond. So you know when you're the last one, you have to make a list of words, so some of them were taken already, which is fine. My word is white. I am um, very into trying to wear white on Yom Kippur, which is not simple because um, I just don't have a lot of white clothing. Um, but a few years ago when I adopted the minhag to wear a kittel on Yom Kippur, that uh, was largely sold. Um, and I truly feel um, elevated when I am all in white and really feel the awe of the day when I'm wearing my kittel. Work white brought to mind for me the young for phrase that if we do appropriate shiva, our sins kashela gyaldini, our sins become white as snow. Now, I don't know, you guys live in New York City, I don't. And it's really hard to picture snow 
be white in New York City. It doesn't stay that way for very long. But there's something about the world after a snowfall that's white and quiet, that that padded sound of the outside that kind of brings everything back to a state of purity and untouchedness that seems like what the analogy is for Hashela Gelbinu, that our souls become quiet and untouched, like new fallen snow, when we are able to achieve a shiva. Beautiful, thank you. We're going to give a chance for uh, all who wish to unmute themselves and uh, just share a, a wish, a word. You can type anything into the chat or just uh, use your voice uh, to wish each other a Shana Tova. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. The inspiration comes from seeing your faces and, uh, and knowing the journey that we're on together as a Bayit family and community seeing friends who uh, we see on the Amim Noraim, friends from generations past of the Bayit, still virtually connected to us, and, and new friends. It's wonderful to be together. May it be a healthy year, peaceful year, year of togetherness, a year of joy, and, and may these sparks of tefillot and texts that matter to us, of midot and attributes that we're working on, and of words and memories uh, stay with us as we go together into a new year. So feel free to unmute, share a, a wish, just lend your voice, use the chat as we conclude. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Rep. Stephen, and the entire rabbinic staff. Want to wish you, it's Bonnie and Isaac, want to wish you a uh, meaningful, uh, a very special chag for both Roshana, Yadkitur, I'm, we look forward to it very much. It's it's a uh, really a peak event for myself and I'm sure for Bonnie as well in the year ahead. I mean. Shana Tova, everybody. Shana Tova. Tova. We'll listen to a little Simcha Artsakha and feel free to sign off when you're ready to go. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here.